Okay, guys. Um, my name is Neil Duffin. I <laughs> uh, if you start know, snoring, I'm going to throw stuff out. I work at Matt. Um, <laughs> and me and my buddy Nate here, we host the irregularly timed uh, Dallas SAS meetup. So, um, one thing that I think happens a lot, uh, oh yeah, you can also hit me up on Twitter or GitHub. Um, when Jeremy originally approached me, I was like, this would be a fantastic time to goof around with MRC Alive, because I don't know a lot about it. Um, and it but it seems neat. And um, I had no idea exactly what I would get into trying to integrate SAS with it. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, for the length of this talk, everything's automatic. So, you know, <laughs> it is actually 100% magic. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about um, basic SAS stuff. So I mean, can like show of hands who has worked with SAS before? Wow, wow you guys are going to learn something. <laughs> so basically. Um, Whenever someone approaches like either Nate or I for um, advice about starting with SAS, generally what they want to know is, you know, how do I move from CSS to SAS? And so I pretty I, I spent some time bringing um, one of our better one of our better landing pages and match into Inverse CLI, um, just so I could get a pretty good feel of how it's going to work, what you have to do to actually uh, get started. But I think most of you guys probably know what SAS is. Um, so really, it's just um, like a superset of CSS. Originally Ruby, now most of the time, you're probably using your SAS, which is based in C, I believe. So um, a lot of the tooling around it, though, is still written in Ruby. So for some of the stuff you'll see uh, tonight, you would actually have to install like gems and a few things, um, which is always a great thing to see when you're looking up the, like, the NPM documentation for um, a package, and it's like, first step, gym install SAS or something like that. So um, this is basic, um, if you want to write stuff down, anybody, this is what you got to write down. Um, for me, this has been like really helpful going through um, just basic SAS or uh, CSS guidelines. Um, SAS guidelines is written by this dude who, for his name, I think his first name is Hugo, but he, he writes a ton of uh, SAS advice, and this is his massive, um, uh, basically, code style guide for SAS. So if you're looking to get started, you read through that thing, you'll probably know more than I do. And uh, the next one is MDO's code guide, and um, the reason I put that up here is MDO worked on uh, Bootstrap originally with Fat, and he likes to keep things incredibly simple, and I think you're going to see that as I go through uh, the style sheets and kind of talk about my reasoning behind what I'm doing and why you may want to do something versus something else. Um, and I'll probably warn you if you start to, when I start to do something I think is like too abstracted, because with SAS it gives you a lot of power, but you can also sort of, I think, work yourself into a trap. And that is one thing he definitely advocates against, pure simplicity. And the last two, of course, are Ember CLI, where you can look at how to get started with Ember CLI. And the Ember add-ons page, which is pretty useful when you're trying to figure out what you can actually install. So now I'm done. <laughs> uh, this is the page. I think you guys can see that. Um, so let's say my hypothetical situation is I have to port this page to using SAS. Um, one of the first things you do, like technically you are refactoring something. And I think one of the first things you want to do um, when you're repackaging stuff is make sure you know, or at least have some sort of documentation about how it works. Um, so I dug around a little bit and I found this neat little tool. God, it's, um, it's called Backstop.js. Um, and hopefully, if you learn one thing, I hope like this is the thing you, you're probably going to learn. Um, it's actually pretty cool. Um, the way it works is a little weird. If um, if you want to install it, it's just npm install. I already have it installed, so I have no idea what this is going to do, actually. How fast is the uh, internet here? OK, there we go. So the way they want you to use it is a little strange, I think. Uh, they want you to head into the actual node modules folder. 
But once you're in here, you can start. Can you guys see what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, once you're in here, you can start issuing um, gulp commands, because everything they do in here is run by gulp, so it's even a little bit stranger. Uh, but the first thing you need to do is establish what's called a reference. Um, so this spit out a bunch of stuff, and essentially what this does is it uses this, um, you see that? So it uses this backstop JS file, or JSON file, that you set up. And the nifty thing about this is it goes through and it creates screenshots of your application at different uh, viewport sizes. So instead of going through and having to test like every single page at all these different resolutions to make sure you're not breaking anything, uh, I think this is actually a pretty good option. So it's built on top of like Casper and Phantom. And I'm not going to get into anything too complex like actually logging in, but you can see that this could be a pretty great tool because once I've generated um, my uh, reference images, I'm going to run a test. And what it's going to do is it's going to pop it open in Chrome. And oh, wait. <laughs> I actually need to start my website first. <laughs> and this is why it's weird that they make you go down into the backstop directory. So those warnings, don't worry about those. <laughs> so now we got to read, uh, get the reference again. And now we can actually test it. So as you go along refactoring your uh, CSS and SAS, you can just take a moment every once in a while. And oh, look at that. Um, this, is actually, this is actually the select box. Is a bug I think I fixed in another branch, but I forgot to put it in here. Um, I don't know if anyone else has noticed this weird bug with Phantom where um, if you don't put a border on select boxes, they go to the top left. So if you do any of like, the most basic level of styling, and I removed some of the styles we had for this because they were powered by, I think, a jQuery UI library, and I didn't have time to get that set up and everything. Um, <laughs> if you don't put any styles on them at all, they'll just end up in the top left. Um, you can literally go in and put like border inherit on them, and that will cause them not to freak out like this. But um, yeah, if you don't, they're going to end up in the top left. So essentially, they um, these, these transparent guys on the third image. That's really your that's your diff. They'll start to light up purple and stuff if you actually break something. Like if I were to open my about here, like I said. Sort of new to <laughs> Ember. So if I were to go here and like blow up this, and then run my test again, I should get failures. Yeah, two failed. And you can see it sort of highlights what you just screwed up. <laughs> so it's it's pretty nifty. Um, Where does it get the reference from? The when I run gulp reference, what does it do? Yeah, like the. Uh, so it's, what is the, yeah, where's the, the reference yeah. Okay. yeah, so the initial command you run to set it up is called reference, and I can oh, show you. Okay. So it, this is part of its weirdness. It kind of goes in and sticks them right here. Okay. In this bitmap reference file. And then as you make new ones, it creates um, new little files for it to cool. run the dip on. So as you go along refactoring, I think this would be like really useful to keep you from Later, you should be under, but. So, that was a cool little tool I came across while doing research on uh, refactoring. But yeah, to address that error you all saw pop up um, when I started the application, I put everything in like this vendor file, and it comes from Ember trying to watch something in the vendor's directory for updates. It doesn't like it when you do that. So the first thing we're going to do is take all of my original .css here that I'm currently loading into my landing page. And what I like to do is, um, actually first thing I'm going to do is create the structure uh, for um, my uh, SAS files. So there are a lot of different patterns out there that you can use um, as far as like structuring your, your files. Um, one is SMAX, which I always misspell. Um, the particular one I'm going to use, SMAX is an alternative to what I'm going to show you. So if you want to do your own research into what you like, SMAX is a good place to start. 
Uh, but the one I'm going to use is actually the one from style, uh, the SAS style guide, or the SAS, SAS guide. Nice. Uh, he talks about it, he calls it 7 and 1. So I just made like a quick little tool where I can pop out a bunch of files. So now if we hop over here, we'll see the inside styles. I have um, a bunch of directories I can use. Um, and you can see that I also have a shame file. Actually, you can't see that, it's very small. Uh, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So, now that I have pretty much a home for everything, that's when you really start breaking things down. And the way SAS works is it looks for files that are named, if you're running a watch, um, it looks for files that end with the SCSS um, uh, file, file extension. <coughs> um, and if, as long as you do not have a leading dash, it's going to try to make that into a separate CSS file. So anything that has a little uh, leading dash, sort of like this shame file, um, it's not going to try and turn that into um, an actual CSS file in your output. Um, the rules might be slightly different for CLI, because really it, they want you to put everything inside app.css. So the first thing we need to do before we can really get to working on that, I've noticed that as I go through adding um, add-ons to Ember itself, I actually need to stop the app or strange things can start to happen. Um, so for Ember, um, or for the Ember CLI uh, SAS package, it's like I was saying, it's just like dead simple. You basically just do um, Ember install Ember CLI SAS, I believe. Um, and it more or less does all the talking NPM for you. And this is just, you don't even have to touch your um, Ember CLI's asset pipeline, which is powered by Brockwood. You don't even have to touch it. It's just going to automatically know <laughs> that you have this. Now it's going to expect, instead of app CSS, I'm going to have app.c or s CSS. So it, it automatically kind of expects this. So we can test this out. I go in here, I try to put something in there to test it. So, you can see, uh, maybe in here somewhere, it might not be working. Always a hazard with live coding. <laughs> so, oh, wait, oh, wait. Does anyone else ever have this problem with Sublime where it doesn't like update your files? Yeah. yeah, you also have it too in a in a Ember CLI application. You have to tell it. It's recommended to tell it to ignore the temp folder, otherwise it spends all of its time watching, like trying to catch up, and it doesn't bother with the rest of your files because of the way There's the Ember CLI like, app is <laughs> is structured. That temp file just gets written to a lot. So this TMP down here, okay. Okay, there we go. Now, <laughs> it's empty like I would expect. So, actually, you can kind of start to see that I've got this thing that's this tiny yellow dot in the corner on line two. Um, I'm going to get to what that is in a second once I make sure this is still working. Yeah, okay. So, you can see here the rule is now just kind of showing up. There's more or less magic aside from having to reopen some line. So, um, what we can now start to do is the first thing I kind of want to do is probably move. I'm going to move my um, original CSS file in here to control S CSS, um, just so I can get it out of that little vendor location. That's kind of just where I stuck it to make it act um, like I thought it should <laughs> for setting up the file. And you can see now I'm, I'm starting to get a bunch of these little uh, linter errors. Um, I'm a pretty big fan of linting things as I work. and um, as I mentioned earlier, you can install this with a gym. Um, the first thing we're, we're going to do is like start 
really, um, actually, actually, the very first thing we're going to do is then import um, something from, we're going to import the original styles from our, into our main app. Okay, broken. Probably named it vendors. Is that what I did? Yeah. And there you go, it's back. So, oh yeah, I forgot to bring that H2 back. Mm -hmm. So, um, this is basically going to be the theme as you go through and you refactor your CSS. Um, what you kind of want to do is keep an eye out for things you're repeating. Um, and you're going to try and place things where you think they should go. That's that's the rule. Um, I think it would really help if you take if you're doing this on a team, you can take your team members aside, sort of chat about where you want things to end up eventually. Because um, this isn't really like these aren't hard fast rules, obviously. These are more um, it's just really so <laughs> everyone on your team can like figure out where things are as you go through and you complete this terrible process together of refactoring CSS. So, uh, this font face rule, um, I think it belongs in a file in base, and base kind of contains anything, to me it seems more like anything where you don't really have a great place to put it. Uh, the 7 and 1 rules say utils is anything that will never ever compile the actual CSS, so that's where you put like your, basically your SAS functions, um, things you want to pull into your files, like variables. Um, vendors, obviously, to me, all your stuff, like my old CSS file, is not really, you know, it's not really SAS, but uh, you put it there. Pages is actually where we're going to end up doing most of our work. You actually can't see that from. Uh, but pages, I'm going to consider this Doritos page, because we, we actually did this for the Super Bowl. I'm going to consider this to be a page instead of a theme. Um, how you break it down is up to you, like I said. Oops. But, kind of start going through and it's a long process of deciding which one of the things I want to go, that sort of stuff. And I like to um, import everything explicitly. <laughs> I'm that kind of guy. So you can actually import with, um, you can import everything with um, like via directories. But I'm not like a huge fan of that. So now I think I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the ledger. So you can see probably I have all these little dots that are showing over there. Um, how many of you use like a ledger inside your text editor? Yeah, so it's the same. It's the same kind of concept. Uh, the thing about uh, this one is you can actually get pretty extreme with it. Um, and I have, I'm actually kind of. <laughs> so if you scroll up, like you can see this giant orange blob here. <laughs> so um, part of a lot of the guidelines you'll see for CSS and SAS in general, they're, they're all about, like some of them do enforce uh, the order that you declare your properties in. Um, and that's one thing you can actually do with these linters. So as you go through and look at these rules, they're going to complain. Like this one says, the property order should be displayed visibly, blah, blah, blah. And that can be super annoying. But as you go, it sort of makes sure everything always looks the same. And the general rule is sort of like positioning, then box small stuff, then colors. Um, and actually, if you look at SAS guidelines, he provides you you look at that site, it provides you with um, <coughs> this file, this CSS ledger file. He doesn't go through and like declare the order properties for you, like I've done here, but um, pretty much everything else he does. And as you go along, you might, when you first start working on porting CSS to SAS, you might want to go ahead and turn most of these off. And just as you get a handle for what you're working with, gradually turn more of them on. 
because you can see, like with my original file, and if I were to now, um, install the um, this Ember CLI uh, SCSS linter, because there is one written for Ember CLI. Um, when you start the application, it's going to yell about yell you about every single rule you break. Um, so that can be a little bit annoying. Oh, right. So this is a weird error that maybe one of you in review can help me with. Um, I noticed it started coming up when I inside of Inverse CLI um, SCSS. I looked at the um, GitHub repository for it, and it has been updated for like 0 0.2. So I don't know if like this broccoli merge tree thing is part of that. Um, but all you have to do to fix it is just come in here and like explicitly install it. Yeah, they they were expecting it to be installed as part of the CLI. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I was thinking of something like that. Um, so if you just go in there and put it in there, um, I get my vendor warning again. So actually, if you're seeing that, um, so there goes my linter. As you can see, <laughs> this might not be something you want to have happening all the time. <laughs> but are those all warnings? Yeah, these are all warnings for my linter, like, um, hey, you could probably put these two rules together, or hey, you should use the shorthand for colors. <laughs> So it's like, none of them are like super serious, uh, but. So did you find with that linter, when you make a change and it rebuilds, does it throw the errors back out again? Because I noticed a lot of those watcher tools only do that type of stuff on the initial build. I'll, I'll show you I'm just happens. curious if this one runs differently or not. I'll show you what happens. Uh, let's do an error. Right? It hates you doing things like this. So that triggers an error. And when you come back here to the linter, it's actually just telling you about the file you changed. Okay. So, but at least it'll tell you that. Right. It works out okay as you're building small correct files um, off of your main original file that you just renamed to be a SAS file. Um, so it's not too annoying when you actually get down to the work, but every time you start it up, yeah. you know, it's dozens of errors. Um, but you can see sort of like the sort of annual things you can enforce is like file should end with a trailing new line. You know, it's almost everything. And that is why the file is this massive YAML thing that just has everything in it. Um, I actually like it a lot. Because um, I like things telling me what to do. <laughs> so um, I think the next thing we can do is probably create a component. And I think a lot of what you'll be doing as you refactor CSS is building components. Because um, Maybe not initially. Like you can see, obviously, in, oops, in my page, this continue like a button itself is obviously something you could or consider a component. But you could eventually, after you figure out, maybe you have a few of these pages. You know, okay, my registration form that's also considered a component. And you just kind of the idea is to map out where your problems are going to be. And once you figure out what the problems are, then you can start setting up variables mix-ins to address the problems. But the first thing you do is break it apart and figure out how it works. I actually didn't write this page, so <laughs> I had to go through and figure out what it actually does. Just like I'm recommending. So I'm going to create a button component. Um, and in here we actually do have, there they are, we do have some buttons. What I've done to create this original CSS file is I've actually combined a few CSS files. So please don't think too poorly of Match because uh, some of this, like we have probably around four to five CSS files controlling every every one of our landing pages. Um, so <laughs> they can be sort of sort of messy. Um, actually, most of the time when you um, when you go through and read SAS guidelines, what he's going to tell you to do is to put your vendor CSS styles at the top. Um, in my case, I'm actually keeping them near the bottom because these are the original styles I'm sort of elevating up. 
the different pieces of my application. So to keep the order correct and to keep it functioning like I like, it's best, I think, to keep it at the bottom if this is the approach you're taking. Um, let's see. So I know there's actually some more buttons in here somewhere that I think act a lot more like. Like a, oh, here's what I'm looking for. This is it. So this guy is the guy that actually controls um, most of the buttons for this page. So you can see it has a lot of the normal kind of stuff you'll see. Like something that happens on focus, we don't want the default outline happening, that sort of stuff. So First thing SAS is my linter is going to want me to do is sort of combine these rules here. So instead of like over qualifying it with an element, sort of just go through and clean it up. But um, now we can kind of, like let's say I think this background blue color, um, I think that's, like I want that to be a variable. And for now, I'm going to keep it here. Um, inside my rule. This is kind of an empty thing about, oh, it's still mad because it wants to be a shorthand. So it's kind of an empty thing about um, SAS is that these rules, these variables that you set up, like this match blue, um, that's actually scoped to that class. So if I then tried to go ahead and use it down here, it should actually blow up on me. There you go. So, like, let's say I want to get around this. Um, just like CSS has rules like important, you can also set this to be global. So that should avoid the error. So there's um, some pretty nifty stuff you can do with these variables, but I'm just going to go ahead and illustrate nesting, because you guys probably know if you work with SAS at all, SAS at all you've worked with nesting. Um, I try not to nest any part of the three. And this is a rule you can actually set up inside your SAS linter. So it will yell at you if you go, uh, like if you go too deep in nesting. And I'll kind of show you the reason why. So like when you do something like, something like this, all right, is everyone, so, is everyone seeing this? So, for this button, I'm just going to go ahead and darken the match blue I already defined. Actually, I'm going to introduce a mix in, I think. Um, so, I have a whole lot of, I have a few default mixins that I like to use. Um, if you've worked with SAS like an extended period of time, you're going to notice that Darken and lighten these methods that they give you, um, they, they don't work so hot. It can be very difficult to say, hey, darken this color 10%. You don't know what's actually going to happen. <laughs> it might be a whole lot darker than you really expect. So one thing you'll see if you dig around in this problem is that a lot of people recommend taking this approach of tinting and shading. And that's where you use the SAS uh, mix function to just sort of mix white into the color to sort of achieve closer to the effect you want. So I'm going to go ahead and create like a mix in file inside my app. And I'm going to use that to create a little darker hover state for my button. So going with the 7 in 1 rules, mix in itself isn't going to produce any CSS. So I'm putting it in my uh, utilities directory. And I'm going to put it at the top because I want all of my uh, following um, partials to have access to it. So now over here in my button guy, I should be able to call uh, shape, hopefully. No, oh, that's not dark enough.
Yeah, so now it has this nice little hover effect as I go. But let's say um, I want to go a little bit farther. Because um, I'm thinking of the future, maybe one day we're going to have a whole bunch of colors that, um, not this page, but other pages we use. So I'm going to go ahead and tie my utilities. <coughs> Directory, I'm going to create some variables. So it's probably yelling at me right now. Whoa. So when you name that file there on the import, it ignores the underscore? Like you don't need to put it? Right. So because you can't have yeah. two files then, the same one without, one with, I'm guessing? Or how does that work? I doubt you could do that and have it work. I mean, you probably could, but what's the really the partial doesn't really signify anything other than this produces a CSS file right. when sassified. So inversely, you like that hides it from you a little bit. But the SAS watch itself, you could theoretically point it at a directory with um, three or four you know files like this that pull in all these different assets and then spit out three or four specific style sheets. So like, let's say you have a bunch of different. Um, Websites will sort of use the same core theme. So for Match, we have like Match.com, Match International, People Media, Match Mobile. They all share some of the styles and a lot of the brand colors. But then we want to treat, tweak different variables. So we pull in different files from manifest files. Now produce like completely different results for each one. So that's really all the underscore signifies. But I do like your question, so I'm going to create one. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem to care. But the import one that creates this CSS So you can't totally do it and it doesn't mind. <laughs> so So here in my variables file, let's say I'm defining a whole random junk or something. I don't even know. So then I can also, SAS has like a sort of interesting concept called a map. Um, I believe the way you create it, I don't create these a lot, but um, Basically, you create them like this, and what you can like, it's going to seem it is a little bit uh, verbose. Like if you've already done um, second minute, there we go. So, oops. So if you've already done. Like you've already defined your um, oops. If you already defined like your um, variables up above, it seems a little weird to I think that should be correct. No worries. So it can seem a little weird to come through and then define them again. So as you go through building this stuff, you might want to keep that in mind. Um, but it allows you to do something sort of interesting if you're making a whole lot of buttons. Um, oops. Yes. So this basically allows you to um, iterate. Nope, I made it. No, we're okay. There we go. So basically what this does is it iterates over um, this map that you have. And this was added like kind of recently in SAS. Um, but you can use this ampersand to reference whatever the root is of your, your rule. So in this case, it's going to be uh, both button register 
and what but from both terms agree. So you got to kind of keep that in mind when you're doing this stuff. Is that the more abstract you get, the less connected you are to the CSS that comes out the other end, and that can be dangerous. And you want to keep an eye on it. So really, what I'm about to do, I wouldn't <laughs> advocate a whole lot, but it is pretty cool. Uh, so basically, I could say I want to add like an extra. Whoops, that's wrong. I want to add a class to, whoops, what did I do? Hang on. I knew I was going to mess this up. <laughs> like I said, I don't write maps a whole lot because I don't agree with them a whole lot. Um, oh, right. Wait. Wait. Um, yeah, so. I'm just going to pull up, um, I'm just going to pull up the button class I defined earlier. Right, right, duh, because you wrote invalid CSS. So, yeah, um, I'm going to show you guys what I just did. doing my React talk, I actually spent 15 minutes debugging something on stage. <laughs> Live coding is always uh, dangerous, especially when you forget the syntax. Those appear the same to everyone else, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. I think it just saves me right now. Oh. It might be. Oh, yeah, duh. It's probably showing me the map file. It's being too clever and too helpful. Okay, I'm going to show you what I just did. There it is. All right. <laughs> okay, so you can see you actually spit out a ton of classes. Um, but the neat thing you can do now is you can go through and be like, match red, and boom, it just changes like that. So for like taking the approach of theming, and if you want to say generate a bunch of these really quickly, it's great. Um, but let's say I am now two developers down the chain, like I don't remember the guy who wrote this, and I come in trying to find this class called match red that's applied to buttons. And I search for match red, what am I going to find? I'm not going to find the button class at all because I've generated it completely through jumping through this map. And in that scenario, doing things more abstracted, it's to be hairy. And that's one of the reasons I think MDO and like a lot of other people are now sort of like, you know, go easy on the nesting, go easy on abstracting. Um, because if you've heard of like um, the BEM method or BEM method of CSS, you can actually just powerhouse your way through this and abstract almost all of your classes if you really want to, but for the sake of making your code searchable, you should probably 
kind of stay away from doing things like what I just did. <laughs> so next thing we can talk about is um, I think media queries. So we're hearing variables actually. So we have this nice little um, rule here. I Usually this was like three rules, but I sort of crammed them down into one. So if you hit the page is ugly, like please don't blame me too much. Or you can blame me and not the designer actually. Um, so one thing you could do is say like, um, just kind of set your small breakpoint to 9.5 or whatever that was. But like it doesn't highlight strings, it drives me crazy. Um, so you'll see this approach right here that I just did. Um, you'll see it in a lot of uh, SAS or SAS based frameworks. Like this is particularly how um, Zerf Foundation they approach uh, the queries. Um, so one thing you need to kind of see yourself doing is. You could eventually set up the map and then just generate a bunch of uh, breakpoint variables if you really wanted to. But um, in the real world, what you really, I, I think generally it's better to be explicit. So um, down here, this inner content guy is actually a big part of our Derpidos page. So if I come here to pages, I'm going to save my new guy named Doritos. I want to show you guys something funny, actually. So, if you want to talk about like maintaining the integrity of the internet, like this link is what three, four months old. If you open it now and it's like an ad for the Avengers, it used to be like one of the Doritos like fine. It was a Doritos Super Bowl ad, and within three months now this link is just broken. <laughs> it kind of drives me crazy. But so now I've got a Doritos file. We got to pull it in here. Obviously, it's gonna make use of a bunch of different stuff. So we pull it in down near the bottom. So somewhere in here is like, I don't know, if many of you have worked with CSS long enough, you remember the days when you all sort of go through and stick all your media query stuff in the one media query you wanted. Um, so that's sort of like, That sort of like allows you to take this sort of stuff and combine it. So when I'm on my small screen, I want to like resize my inner content essentially. So, so we don't need that anymore. Obviously, it's three. Testing that. Oh. Did I get an S in you guys? I did. I'm actually gonna remove that. I don't like that. So it should still work, hopefully. So it's not more broken than I had it before with the, when I removed the title. <laughs> That's the whole problem is if you accidentally delete some stuff, it can be hard to reset your test. So that's essentially how you do a media query. Um, uh, this is more or less how most of your frameworks are going to be dealing with approach it. So if you wanted to set a new baseline for backstop, could you just run that reference again? 
Yes. It's a great new base model. Yes. I can do that pretty quickly. And it should, hopefully since it's one second apart, it should be fine. Yeah. So, which, I don't know exactly what you would want to do if you accidentally re-reference. Um, that would be bad. Um, is it possible to go back and reference? Or? Not that I know of, no. Because you'll see like what it actually does. Um, you know it. So it, it, it'll hang on to... Oh. So it, it'll hang on to... I believe it just... Yeah. See, if they had 806, that was just now. We went ahead and deleted it. Like in this bitmap reference is where it keeps it. And then it actually does keep the results of different tests. Like these are the new screenshots, but I guess it just blows away the actual reference file itself. So, so you, you actually check those in. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, you check it in as in. Yeah, you could. That's yeah, when you're as part of your build, it goes through and automates the screens you care about. Yep. <clears throat> I think it's a little, like, the desktop itself is a little bit <laughs> rough around the edges. Like, the way you use it's a little weird, but I think the concept itself is pretty good. Yeah, exactly. Mm, so I have one more trick to show off. And then I, like I said, using University Alliance S ended up being a lot easier than I expected. <laughs> um, but I saw him while, I saw this group of styles while I was, last time I was in here. So we have all this header stuff, and if you've ever wondered why, like a lot of the time you see um, header as HDR or button as BTN, the thinking behind that is there is a header element. So when you search for a class, you also don't like button. You don't want it to be the word button because you have button element, and you'll get mixed results. And I think the idea is to sort of avoid that kind of collision. Um, so that's why our header is named HDR. I'm going to do the new layout file. And hopefully this works. I haven't used this in a little bit. <laughs> and layout, if you follow the rules for um, the 7 and 1 approach, comes down here. There's this, there's another kind of neat tool. Let's see if this works. It does, okay. So there's another neat tool called um, CSS Comb, which I love hate. Um, CSS Comb is just like I defined in my SAS um, CSS. That's another problem when you're working with CSS, or SCSS, that sometimes people name their package after SCSS, and sometimes they name it after SAS. So when you go searching for something, you might have to run, you might have to look twice as hard. Um, so you'll notice, like, like I mentioned before, like all of this, all of these rules um, for the order of your element, or the order of your um, rules, um, I actually grabbed those from a CSS home file. So if you're ever like in this situation where you have everything on a lot, like one line, and you don't really want to, you want to organize it quickly. You can install this plugin called CSS Comb, and the default settings are very nice, but as soon as you try tweaking them, um, I think the plugin like starts to lose some of its functionality. Because in def default mode, it actually puts everything on new line and groups it. But once you tell it a, like a custom order to put your properties in, it stops making like separating the rules with the new line. So it all it reorders it on a single line. And in match, we have a lot of code. Oops. A lot of code that looks like this. Um, because way back 20 years ago, <laughs> Match was, uh, we, they don't minify their CSS much. Like they're very, at least on like the landing pages, nothing's minified or combined. So general practice has been to write a bunch of styles on one single freaking line. <laughs> and um, when you're refactoring and you're going towards SAS, this isn't a problem anymore. So the CSS comic, you can just like quickly pop it out into a rough order. And the other thing it does is it goes through and anytime something that might have set by linter exists, like some of these rules probably, like they might not have semicolons, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, actually, you can see one of the rules in practice. This uh, background is defined with six, the six zeros for black. Um, once you run it through, whoop, I just made that. Once you run it through CSS comb, it actually makes it the three, just the, the abbreviated uh, syntax. Um, so it's a nice way to sort of get from <laughs> something really compressed and unenjoyable to um, something you actually read, uh, which is nice. So, like in this situation, maybe I want to use like scope variables. Actually, I don't. So, one cool thing you'll notice about RGBA, um, this is actually also a SAS method. So, if I want to, instead of writing out that, I prefer you know, to write it out like this. Because to me, I'm like, that makes more sense. And in this case, it's a little silly because they're not the same. Like, it's black. But if that were my match blue or whatever variable I had to find, I could then just pass it to RGBA and you know make it a little more transparent. Uh, now the rest of this stuff that's complaining about right here is um, really that it wants me to clean it up a little bit. But I think instead I'm going to do. Uh, when you do ember install, it say it flags it as save dev, right? For the ember CLI? Like it's saved yes. Okay. Yeah. So now there's this new tool. I think this is the name for it. Okay. There's this new tool that um, is kind of gaining popularity called uh, PostCSS. I've actually written a plugin for it. Um, my plugin is completely useless. That's not my best name. Um, but the most popular plugin for PostCSS is called Auto Prefixer. And this, I believe this is the correct name for it. Yeah. Um, it does have an Ember CLI um, add-on. So um, what this does is pretty nifty. Traditionally with SAS, um, you would probably use this really big extension called Compass to do the one thing that Auto Prefixer does. And most of the things you're going to do with Compass, you can accomplish with Auto Prefixer a little bit more interesting way. Um, what Auto Prefixer does is after it's a post um, CSS post processor, so where SAS sits in front of the CSS you generate, this sits after. So after you generate your CSS, you then run it through a post-CSS process. And Auto Prefixer, what it does is it looks for things like um, display flex, for example. Um, and it's going to go through and it flags everything as WebKit, MOZ, MS, whatever it needs to flag for you, it goes through and it does that after you generate your CSS. So it's actually very hard to get this page to start producing the rules because um, kind of one of the nicer things about it I'll just pull up my configuration file. Um, one of the nice things about it is this the syntax they have for um, right here. So when you pull it into your um, universalized Brock file, Brockly file, I don't know the, which one is it. <laughs> um, you can pass, when you turn on your Ember app, you can pass it some preferences for this. And I think this is actually pretty neat. Because um, this looks at, if you're familiar with uh, caniuse.com, um, if you haven't seen it before, it's basically a way to go and see if you can use CSS and like JavaScript stuff and what their limitations are in certain browsers. But it also will tell you something like Chrome 31 has 0.71% of global usage. And the nifty thing about this is that in my configuration for post CSS, I can come here and say like greater than 5%. And that's all I would have to write. And it would go in. And any browser that has more than 5% usage share 
based on can I use this data, um, it'll automatically nice. support it with the appropriate prefixes. So <laughs> most of the things that we have that qualify on this landing page are things like border radius on this button. And it turns out border radius is just like super well supported these days. <laughs> um, so that's why I have things like uh, Firefox greater than or equal to 10. You gotta go way back to actually get it to <laughs> show up in the generated styles. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move this to my, actually get rid of this. Go ahead and add it to my Match blue. As you go through, you're refactoring your CSS. That's the sort of thing you're going to have to find. So now, instead of these two border radiuses for the guy, what were they? Five of these? I should be able to just do that. This one already had it. <laughs> So, like I said, match. Kind of goes back and forth about what they support. So, yeah. There you go, there they are. Um, you see it's sort of, no wait, that's the old one. I'm not actually sure it's running right now. <laughs> it might not be running. But, yeah, that's basically how it works. Um, the plugin I wrote for CSS, all it does is go through and it um, is important to every CSS rule in, in your style guide, so it's not exactly useful. But um, yeah, I think I think that's pretty much the basics for plugging everything into Ember CLI. Um, it went much better than expected, so hats off to Ember CLI for making it very easy to use SAS with it. And I guess if you guys have any questions, you can ask me now. Yeah, one of the things you kept saying was refactoring to SAS. So is that like a common flow for most development teams? Do you write locally in CSS before you commit code and you refactor to SAS? I do not think so. But I think a lot of people these days are encountering situations where they do want to move from CSS to SAS. Like Match themselves started playing with preprocessor for CSS in the last few years. So before that, they had 19 years of established history with CSS. So there's like there's no other real word to call that for me anyway, uh, like aside from refactoring. It's right, just so like a lot of existing code in right. CSS. Right, and as you go through and break it out into like components and modules, there's a chance you're definitely going to break something <laughs> because CSS likes order, and maybe you're also going through. And if we have, like the further we dig into this, the more you'll see. We scope things to IDs, and maybe your new, like your new objective is to avoid using IDs. Um, like there are important tags in there, and if your objective is to go through and clean all that up, like that to me, that's definitely a refactoring. But no, I don't think most most people do not write CSS and then turn it into SAS. It's only like unfortunate people. But I do get asked this. I get uh, this is the most common question. I got the SAS meetup. People were like, so how would you go about? Taking CSS and making it SAS. So I was like, ah, oh, I'll give it a shot for the Ember CLI video. In the context of Ember CLI, I doubt it happens that often. Because everyone using Ember CLI is so hip. It's So now, 
Relatively speaking, how many people are jumping over to SAS from CSS? Are, are there a lot of... Hard numbers I don't have, but if Match is doing it, you can bet a lot of you, a lot of enterprise size companies are doing it. Because um, I, 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 I have... We use SAS here. Because I don't see any reason for staying back in the CSS from what I saw here. Yeah, I mean, I don't personally see one. No, I think a lot of it, too. It depends on what you're... I mean, you could always use SAS even... I, mean, I don't even know if it was around 15 years ago, but you could have always used it 15 years ago. But a lot of the popularity is... They talk about, you know, new hip stuff, whether it's Ember or it's Backbone or Angular, all of these, you know, front-end build processes. You've got these plugins into that ecosystem now where you're already building your app. Mm -hmm. Like, CSS has always kind of been that front-end thing, but it's served by back-end, and it was always this weird world. And so if somebody cared enough to do those tools and put a build process in place for you. I mean, normally it was just some sort of script, right? A scripting language that would just serve it out. Like, oh, you mean I gotta get a build process and run a cron job or, you know, depending on your platform. But nowadays, like with Ember CLI specifically, we're already into a build cycle. It's right. no big deal. You just throw one more add-on in there and just let it build. Right. Now I can write SAS or LESS or any other preprocessor just natively as I go, especially obviously with a brand new project, you know, there's absolutely no no uh, pain in that because you're starting fresh. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's the argument. Um, Visual Studio has actually recently become a lot better about uh, putting node and everything into it. But back back when they were making these decisions, you know, it was it was I think it was a little big project entirely. I think you're very brave. Very brave. Because yeah, well, you're coding on the fly. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really feel like, very good job. like twice. Very good. <laughs> well, like the worst is when you draw the blank on the syntax and you're like, ah. Right. Watch me Google it. <laughs> well, that's why, like, I, I've gone through this site like twice and rewritten it in from CSS to SAS. So that's why I had like the reference files I could pull up whenever I would like get a reference. So yeah, good job. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was really good.